So one of the things we've seen is the senator has really had a collaborative process with industry in Washington, whether we're dealing with the threat of counterfeits, uh, illegal streaming, uh, we're dealing with issues in the patent system or the copyright office. He's at the forefront of all of that, but what he does is he brings people in to talk to him and his staff and have a collaborative process so that people can work together to find meaningful solutions. So number one, I want to thank you for your leadership and for your attention to these issues. It's been great to work with you and your staff. And for those of you who are not familiar with how things work in Washington, if you don't have a good staff supporting a great leader, uh, you're in trouble. So he's got a great team, and we really appreciate working with him. Um, maybe uh, we could start by just talking a little bit about your personal interest and why you thought it was important to reestablish the IP subcommittee in the Judiciary Committee, and how that's perhaps relevant to some of the folks you represent here in North Carolina. Well, uh, thank you all, and uh, thank you, and thank you for being there, and James, thank you for taking care of my pickup truck. Uh, <laughs> uh, before I get started, I have some staff here, uh, my official staff, Luke, uh, is on my political team, Luke Blanchett, uh, James Estes is economic development for this area, <clears throat> also have Ryan, <clears throat> excuse me, Ryan Adam and Shil Patel, uh, who are from Washington, D.C. They, uh, they get out a lot. I have a requirement for my D.C. staff to come back to the state, so they spend a lot of time here, and are willing to, uh, to speak with any of you or set up meetings in the future. The reason for the IP subcommittee, now I'm not an attorney. Actually, when Mitch McConnell asked me to be on the Judiciary Committee, I remember it vividly. It was two weeks after I was elected and I'd selected committees. I had not selected Judiciary. I'd selected Senate Armed Services and Veterans Affairs as the two must committees and said if I couldn't be on those, then I didn't want to be on any because I would just dedicate my time to working off the Committee of Jurisdiction, but I got them. And then he said, well, I want you to consider a, a couple of other committees as well. One of them was aging. I said, I'm aging, I'm in, uh, <laughs> and, uh, which was a great committee. Uh, but they also, I want you to consider judiciary. And I said, well, you know, Mitch, I served on judiciary in the uh, State House uh, before I became speaker, so it, I wasn't an attorney, but kind of view things through a business perspective. He said, that's why I want you on it, uh, because we have a lot of attorneys and other people with various backgrounds. And I said, ah, sure, how hard could it be? I forgot about that whole Supreme Court thing in judiciary. Um, <laughs> but it's proven to be one of my favorite committees, honestly. And one of the reasons why is because it looks like the most partisan, vitriolic environment you could see on C-SPAN and on cable news. Uh, but it's actually the birthplace of some of the most collaborative uh, opportunities that I've had since I've been in the Senate. And Chris Coons, who's a good friend of mine, is a classic example. It kind of reminds me of this duo up here working together at the city. Um, we decided that we really needed to, to read. The world has changed a lot since we had a subcommittee dedicated to intellectual property protection. The whole biosimilars, biotech, uh, world of research didn't really exist the last time that this committee was in place. Uh, the technology field has changed a lot. Intellectual property theft and reverse engineering is on steroids, China being the, the worst offender among them. So we made the proposal to uh, now Chairman uh, Lindsey Graham, he thought it was a good idea. Now, the process of engagement, it's been a lot of fun because we've said this is not just something for oversight. We want to determine what we can do that is a fair next generation intellectual property baseline uh, to provide certainty in areas that don't have certainty. But uh, I'm, I'm a management consultant. I was a partner at Price Waterhouse, worked downtown here a lot longer than I ever worked in politics. I'm not a subject matter expert in intellectual property. Uh, I am fairly good at defining a problem and then working through a methodology to solve the problem. So we, we sat down and first looked at the, uh, the uh, patent issue that we're going to make progress on, but I wanted an engagement model that wasn't some staffers working with a couple of think tankers to come up with a baseline proposal that we would try to get through. I said, I want heavy engagement from industry, from both sides of the issues, from the do nothing to throw it all out, and we did that. We had, uh, my, uh, my lead uh, legal counsel was in here, but I would guess that over the course of five stakeholder meetings, uh, we had as many as 200 people engaged. We took comments afterwards. And it was really funny because most people are so wired to the way Washington works. They go, what are they up to? 
They're asking for our suggestions. They seem to be responding. They made changes to the language. My God, this seems like regular order. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. It's an iterative engagement model um, and in, in complete uh, uh, cooperation with the USPTO and Director Iancu to come up with something that preserves what's working but addresses what's not. And when you have a senior judge, oh, and, and incidentally, we did something else. So these were stakeholder groups. Some folks would say, well, maybe that's uh, window dressing. They're still going to do what they want to do. Then we scheduled a series of three hearings over the course of about a week and a half that had three panels of five each, so 45 experts uh, across the spectrum from the ACLU who was saying they're just going to try and allow somebody to grant a patent for a, a gene that exists. Uh, in nature, and the other side, uh, it, 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 the broad spectrum, in other words. We heard from all of them and we responded to it. We put a baseline together, we've worked with the USPTO, we know we need more work to do. But let me give you an idea of how profound the change may be. We're, we're talking about Section 101 of, uh, of uh, patent law. The last time the words of Section 1 were touched were when Thomas Jefferson wrote them. Yeah, and I've, I've actually joked about this. I'm sure I've, I've got a primary, so it's going to be Tom Tillis has the audacity to question the words of Thomas <laughs> Jefferson. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson got it right back when they were working on this first draft. Uh, but we did not have the opportunity for innovation that exists today if we get this right, particularly in the biotech, pharma, um, and uh, emerging uh, healthcare space. And today, when you have a judge who's adjudicated over... 800 cases of patent law um, come before our committee. And I ask them, if you were the patent attorney for pick a company uh, in the space that we know we have so much uncertainty, could you advise your client on the patentability of uh, some promising compound or area of research in uh, healthcare? He says, no way. There, there, there is too much jurisprudence, um, good decisions based on bad analytics. So you've got all of this jurisprudence out there. You may be okay with the, the, uh, the ruling, but you're not okay with the analytical framework that could be used improperly going forward. So you have to look at what kind of, what kind of changes can you make to give certainty to those who don't have it today? Um, what cr past jurisprudence could you abrogate to prevent a bad outcome or, or more uncertainty through the uh, future legal processes that will almost certainly follow, but then also preserve what's working. So you have to try and bridge the gap between high tech and other industries that may be okay with the status quo. But they all said to a person, we understand it's a problem, it's just not our problem. And my, my challenge is to preserve the technological innovation advantage that we have for those who are satisfied with it, but then to provide that same to an area that is literally life-saving opportunities for us. We're talking about advanced innovation with Alzheimer's, with cancer, with any number of diseases that we're on the brink of providing tailored medicine for you to fix that problem. As long as we can, or for your, the subtle differences in your makeup that we can optimize medicine to fix. There's going to be a lot of work, a lot of investment, a lot of clinical trials, a number of other things that are going to have to happen, but I will tell you it will happen much, much sooner, and many more people will benefit, and the United States will benefit by the accumulation of that intellectual property, which is why we're doing it. Long-winded answer to your question, but it's a very, very important process that we're going through that I give pretty good odds. We're working on a bipartisan, bicameral basis. When we move forward, with changes, we're constantly checking with our colleagues, Democrats and Republicans in the House, to make sure that we're swimming down the same lane. I'd just like to follow up on that for a moment because the Senator is exactly right when he talks about the threat to innovation if we don't have a predictable and stable patent system and one that provides certainty to industry. Uh, you know, it's really remarkable when you look at what's happened in terms of the United States continuing to lead in innovation, particularly in research and development in pharmaceuticals and medical devices. But that's at risk. We see other 
countries, that, you know, particularly China, as the senator mentioned, that now have really devoted entire policies and programs to trying to overtake the United States as the innovation leader. It's a real threat to our ability to keep Americans working, but also to bring those life-saving products and those new technological advances to the forefront. So the work the senator is doing is directly relevant. You know, in the uh, area, region around Charlotte, I think you all know better than I, you have 15 major research universities just here in the North Carolina region. Think of the great work they're doing and think about those you know, amazing discoveries that are coming out that they're partnering with industry on. So I, I just want to commend you on that work and thank you as a, a former House staffer who worked for a member of Congress who was also a non-lawyer on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, I can tell you that bringing common sense to a theoretical discussion is sometimes the most important input you can have in Washington and having also a real world perspective. So I thank you for taking that on. I know it's not an easy task, but you've been doing yeoman's work. Um, I'd also like to point out that when we're talking about patent protections, it's something that realistically, not every business is gonna be able to afford to go through the patent process. So increasingly people think of intellectual property as something that maybe only big companies or people who have a lot of money can utilize. But we see increasingly trade secrets and other forms of intellectual property being used by small businesses throughout the country. And perhaps, Senator, you might touch on the fact I'm sure there are an awful lot of small businesses in North Carolina. Now, I can tell you that almost 20,000 IP registrations happened in the year we did our annual job uh, study on the jobs related to IP, but about 20,000 registrations for IP, mostly patents, copyrights, trademarks, came out of North Carolina in that year alone. And I can tell you, in the years that have passed since that study was done, that number has increased. So could you perhaps talk just a little bit about how IP also might be relevant to some of the small businesses? Well, I think it's critically important. One of the reasons, well, first off, one of the reasons I like patents is in order to get a patent, you have to share a lot of the information around what it is that you want to secure the uh, intellectual property on. Why is that important? Because other people can look at that and it could instruct additional areas of innovation and research. It shares information. Consider it almost a... Uh, open source concept. If you think about how open source is accelerated technological advancement, uh, think of a common kind of open source with the protection of your fundamental intellectual property rights, but sharing that information so that you can accelerate the pace of innovation. So we have to make it easy. That, that's one of the reasons. Some of the reasons why patents are not sought is because it costs too much. You could spend a few years trying to do it and end up nowhere. To the judge's point, he couldn't tell a small business whether or not they can get a patent, so they'd go down other, other uh, paths to protect their intellectual property for some period of time. The, uh, the thing that we have to do is if we provide certainty, I think we will see more people seek patents because they've got a better chance of getting it, uh, but in other cases, they won't. The, the, the first phase of our intellectual property reform was really on patents, but we're also uh, having a series of meetings now on trademarks, copyrights, uh, trying to figure out what more we can do there to provide uh, certainty and protections. But I'm, I'm a real big believer in trying to share more information so that we can accelerate uh, innovation. Um, we also have a number of digital streaming, for example. I mean, we have a lot of digital content theft that we, first off, I think we have to take actions uh, in the criminal code uh, to to get rid of, not, not some bonehead that that illegally stream something in a den, but somebody who set up a server that's a gateway to streaming illegal content. I mean, that's theft no different than going into a store here and stealing $50,000 worth of goods. Uh, so we're, we're working on all of those tiers, and we'll, we'll have additional hearings. We've had some comments on uh, trade secrets, but those will be layered in over this Congress, and I think that we'll have baseline, particularly for, for uh, for uh, trademarks and uh, copyrights, and uh, and then another stream purely on intellectual theft. You know, it's interesting, the uh, 20,000 registrations I mentioned, a uh, large number of those were copyright related. And uh, you know, we do a lot of research at the chamber, so I'll give a little plug for our study on the impacts of digital piracy. 
But just to give some context to the scope of this problem, you know, a lot of times folks think, oh, well, you know, the Hollywood studios or the big broadcasters, they're not being, you know, hurt by a little bit of piracy or somebody just watching something for free in their home. And I think the senator is exactly right. No one wants to, you know, criminalize behavior in the living room that's just somebody who's making a mistake and sometimes unknowingly downloading something illegally. Uh, but when you start talking about the scale, this is 29 billion minimum economic loss per year to the United States economy writ large. 300,000 plus American jobs being lost as a result of digital piracy. And when you talk about the scope of digital piracy, increasingly we see it happening through streaming. Nearly 80% of digital piracy now occurs through streaming because that's now the new technology that people are delivering content to their various devices on. So when you talk about streaming as an issue, people think of it, well, it's just Hollywood, it's just broadcasters. Not at all. It impacts the sports leagues. You've got a whole sports uh, you know, element here in North Carolina. But it also hurts all those small businesses that when they're filming outside of Hollywood in states, you've got the carpenters, you've got uh, the folks who are helping to cater the food, you've got the electricians. You've got all these folks who are helping out who are local small businesses being put to work. They're not going to have that opportunity if that money's taken away. Yeah, we did. A, <clears throat> last year I worked with Lamar Alexander on the Music Modernization Act, which was another area that I think is very important. You, you can't really have a world-class scientific community without also having a world-class arts community. They go hand in hand. Um, and so protecting and, and promoting that, uh, that next Mozart, I think Prince was very close, by the way, but, but, um, but, uh, but, but protecting and promoting the artist community and their intellectual property is critically important. And, and that's why we're, we're working. The, the copyrights are in the Library of Congress. We just had a hearing uh, uh, about a month ago on a modernization project that they have going, an IT modernization project. So that's back in my lanes. And, and, and making sure that we can make it easy for the starting artist or make it easy for the small business to engage the intellectual property system in the lane that makes sense for them. You know, very often folks think that when you're trying to protect intellectual property, you're somehow inhibiting new technologies. And I think what the senator said earlier is very apt. What we're trying to do is encourage innovation. The chamber is not interested in restricting the growth of new industries. But when you look at things from the standpoint of something like the issue of an exception for certain types of illegal activity that needs to be closed, what they call the felony streaming loophole, uh, the chamber's long supported a fix there. Um, it, it's complicated because sometimes think, well, you know, people say you're going after um, the internet guys, or you're going after the tech community, but that's not the case. You're going after criminals who are acting at scale, and you're going after things that impact the U.S. economy. You are really not trying to create more liability for technology. Yeah, the so, one thing I will also say for the entertainment industry, some, it, it's amazing how the best ideas usually come through hallway conversations, but I had, there's a young guy named Tony in our cloakroom, the Senate cloakroom, and he has a friend who was deployed in Afghanistan, uh, and this is back when Game of Thrones' uh, final season was out. And yeah, he's, well, I'm, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan too, and it, it hadn't occurred to me that if you're Ford deployed in Afghanistan, you may not have a legal method for streaming it. And, uh, and so we found that there are area jurisdictions where the only way you could get the content is to stream it illegally. So I've gone in the entertainment industry and said, y'all really aren't, you guys are okay with maybe giving content to somebody who's for deployed in Iraq or Afghanistan, aren't you? And, and they've all to a person said yes. So we're trying to figure out what we may need to change so that those men and women have, have that, and I thank them. So obviously a common sense solution. And from our perspective, we agree. Uh, you, know, you don't need to be overly punitive in terms of the penal code or how you're going to look at solutions. You want to do things that are going to work. Um, and Speaking about the armed services, you know, one of the things I think a lot of people don't realize is just how pervasive counterfeit goods have become. Uh, we have a military supply chain that really uh, is essential to the safety of our service members, 
And when counterfeit chips or counterfeit products are part of that supply chain, they put our military at risk. And actually, the same thing is true even here at home with some of those folks who are you know, in the police or the fire. Uh, you know, if they have counterfeit goods that they can't rely on, they're putting their lives at risk. So for our service members abroad, the integrity of our supply chain is paramount. So I want to commend the senator also for the very good focus. He's, uh, the committee's done some hearings on counterfeiting, and we'll continue to look at these issues. But counterfeits are a big problem. This is a big public safety issue. I think your point is well taken for the uh, the DOD supply chain. But we had a hearing where um, I, I'm a I'm, a, I'm an avid mountain biker, so it's like you're either Ford or Chevy. I'm I, I'm all things specialized. So I buy specialized bikes. I buy specialized helmets. And there was this specialized helmet. Um, I, I, the importance of a helmet cannot be understated. I don't ride, ride out to my mailbox without a helmet on. Why? Because I've broken two helmets uh, on a single track mountain bike trail. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to break so my skull didn't. So we had a demonstration, a guy about my size, um, uh, came before us on the dais, there's this helmet, looked just like a specialized helmet, probably a $100, $120 helmet. Um, he did nothing more than jump about a foot and a half in the air and went onto that helmet and it squashed into the ground. It had the styrofoam, it had the, the, uh, the plastic coating, looked just like a specialized helmet, but if I had had that helmet on the two times that I've hit a tree, um, I'd probably either be dead or, or have experienced brain damage. So the one thing I'll tell you, if you buy a bike helmet, particularly for a kid, jump up on it, it should not crush. <laughs> Um, but that's, I mean, that's everywhere. It's on Amazon, it's on eBay. One of the things that we have to do is, is come up with an authentication process to make sure that what you think you've sourced is exactly what you've sourced. We absolutely have to do that. Uh, because the, the specialized example is just one good relevant example for me, but it happens every day on particularly internet sourced sites. And we've got we've to hold the supply chain to the consumer accountable for authenticating that what you're selling is in fact what you know what they're expecting to purchase you know, it's, a, it's a great point and as someone who was in the room when that demonstration happened i can tell you there was literally an audible gasp from the folks in that room when that helmet got crushed and you know it's a safety issue when you're dealing with counterfeits but it's also a jobs issue um, I think that uh, I don't have the state-specific numbers in terms of the job loss in North Carolina to counterfeiting, but each year over 750,000 jobs in the United States are lost as a result of counterfeiting. And if you think about you know, the consequence to people's lives, job loss is one thing, but loss of life is a whole other issue. Now, a lot of times when you're dealing in the online environment, uh, particularly if you're dealing with purchasing pharmaceuticals, 90% uh, of the online pharmacies, according to a study just a couple of years ago, are selling counterfeit product. Now, that is bad enough if you're dealing with something like Viagra, but when you're dealing with something like health Medica I'm sorry, heart medication or cancer medication or something that you, know, you think is a life-saving drug you're trying to save a few bucks on, that, that's a pretty scary proposition. So the supply chain integrity the senator talks about is a tremendous issue. Senator, could you talk maybe just a little bit about how e-commerce has changed the way we deliver product to people and also the need for consumers to really protect themselves? Because it's not just the purchase of the counterfeits, it's also exposing themselves to criminal enterprises. Oh, it has. Actually, I want to I want to make sure I touch on the, the maybe I should start with that. We're, um, you know, e-commerce, most of my profession has been in technology. I was a partner standing up e-commerce platforms back in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. So we were, we were doing the original marketplaces for industry-specific supply chains, and those were more or less closed loop systems where you did the strategic sourcing, you developed a supply base, and then you would have a consortium of users. They could even be competitors, but they got the economies of scale. But, but you had a clear line of sight between the, the manufacturer, the supplier, and the end product. So the authentication was built into the strategic sourcing process. You know, now you got any one of us can go on eBay and sell something. I, I do it. I actually uh, use Let Go. I think that's the latest one I use. You know, to get rid of all the junk I should have never kept. Um, but now anybody, you know, anybody's a source. And um, 
And then you have these various platforms that are take all commerce. Some have different standards, but we've got to come up with a, a standard that gets back to really knowing what you're buying, what's in it, whether or not it actually, uh, it, somebody in the, in the supply chain has to be responsible for the fact that what the consumer purchased is not what they thought. And that's gonna require some, probably some federal action. Um, but we've gotta do it right, because it's also one of the most extraordinary opportunities in the, the history of humankind. When I can sit down and say, I wanna get the, I, 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 my uh, granddaughter, I got a, a 22 month old granddaughter, and uh, she loves splashing around in water parks and stuff. So I said, I wanna get a little mini water park for my yard. So I thought about it, 15 minutes later, I'd found something, 24 hours later on a Sunday, I had it at my house. I mean, that's extraordinary. It could have been an idea that never came to be. So there's, there's all kinds of good that has come from the internet-based economy. But now we have to realize it's the new norm for most of our retail acquisitions. I still want the brick and mortar stores and, and other presences to, uh, to thrive, but they're also gonna have to thrive in an environment where they've gotta play in the internet space to be competitive. Now, with respect to criminal enterprises, this is an area that I think we have to go back to uh, firms that make money off of advertising and vectoring people into things of interest to them. And they either, uh, back in, I think it was 2012, we passed chop shop legislation in the state. I don't know if you're familiar, we had a big problem with auto theft. People would buy a car, it would all of a sudden go into this nondescript garage at one end, it was a full car, at the other end it would come out parts because it's safer and actually uh, more profitable to sell a stolen car for parts than it is to sell it as a whole car. So we passed legislation that said, we're gonna define a criminal enterprise from the point in time that a car was stolen until the point, you know, until the point in time we find people buying it, knowingly buying stolen parts as a criminal enterprise. How does that relate to the internet? Well, I think of it as the landlord part of the criminal enterprise. If you're renting out a garage, and this is not a folks that's doing mechanicking, and all of a sudden you observe from time to time a car coming in looking this way and going out looking like parts, you either knew or should have known that there was a criminal activity there and you should have reported it to authorities. Well, I think that a YouTube, a Google, um, a, a, a Facebook, if you take a look at uh, some of the criminal activities that we're finding there, human trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, child pornography, um, if you see patterns where at some point that internet service provider is getting ad click revenue for something that ultimately leads someone to an, a criminal enterprise, you better get your governance in place to, to make sure you either knew, should have known, and report to authorities. That's the way we're gonna solve the problem without having a heavy hand at uh, uh, big government regulatory approach to it. We just have to say, guys, we want you to thrive Advertising revenue is fine. If your platforms are free, you gotta pay for your, your enterprise somehow. But you better know how people are using your system. And when it's for malign purposes, you need to be held accountable if you're not reporting to authorities the moment you identify potential suspicious activity. Uh, absolutely, and, and again. And incidentally, we do that in banking every day, right? If you're in banking, you have, it, it, it's a little clunky. We actually need to, uh, to fix the, uh, the current environment for suspicious activity in, in banking, but it's the same sort of construct for a different enterprise. And again, I want to reemphasize, you know, the senator nor the chamber is talking about trying to inhibit technology or inhibit the ability for consumers to get things more rapidly or- I want more of it. Absolutely, we want to see that innovation. We want to encourage new innovation that's going to create new jobs. But uh, before we leave the issue of counterfeiting, there's something that I think some folks don't necessarily know about. It's something that we're concerned with because when we talk about the impact of counterfeiting in economic terms, that's one thing, even though we think economic security is national security at the chamber. There's also a component of not just criminal elements, but terrorists who actually benefit from the sale of counterfeits. And increasingly large multinational criminal organizations, including drug runners and others, have shifted away from those crimes, which are very, very heavily penalized, uh, has carry very strong penalties if you're convicted, to counterfeiting, which of course is much less onerous in terms of the criminal code. Uh, so could you maybe just touch briefly on that national security aspect of IP crime? 
Well, they're definitely uh, money sources, and I would also add that even in the uh, the internet or social media space, there's money being made uh, uh, through getting people to websites and 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 uh, advertising that we we need to do a better job of understanding. But uh, you know, in the old days or the not so long ago days, uh, you would have crim we, we've had some publicly reported cases. There are others that haven't that. Uh, you would have uh, either domestic or, or other sort of terrorist or criminal organizations. You know, they go buy cigarettes in a low-cost state and then sell them in, in a high-cost state. So you pick up cigarettes in South Carolina and go up to New York and sell them. That's how they made their money. Now they've found it a lot easier to do it on the Internet where they're faceless and nameless. And in some cases, they're doing... Uh, helmets, or they're doing dolls, or they're doing something else that's roughly approximate to whatever the competitive product is and selling it for half the price. That's how they're making their money. And, and that's why we've got to have a better construct for governance going forward so that we can report agencies when we're seeing Barbie dolls coming out of Syria um, and uh, saying that may not be right. We've got, I mean, it, it can't be heavy handed, but it, it, it has to be different because of the because of the vast majority of transactions that are occurring online. You know, we live in an increasingly global economy. Uh, the United States has a very great bright spot when it comes to the IP sectors in terms of what they contribute, not only to our GDP, but also to our trade uh, surplus. Uh, they are absolutely the bright light uh, in terms of our industry sectors. But when we're talking about trade, uh, you know, there are some things that the chamber agrees with the administration on, some we're not so crazy about. Uh, we certainly are not as supportive of the impact that uh, tariffs are having, particularly at the local level. The ability for local economic growth to be muted by uh, tariffs is something we're concerned with. Um, we absolutely agree with the administration on the USMCA. And the USMCA is the sort of NAFTA 2.0. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, it also has a robust IP chapter, which means there are now provisions in this trade agreement which allow for a standard of IP protection in Canada and Mexico that was just simply not included in the original NAFTA. And one of the reasons for that is that you know, when NAFTA was actually developed, there wasn't any such thing as streaming. You know, there were a number of issues that just didn't exist. So from that standpoint, perhaps you could talk a little bit about your views on trade and the important role having a robust IP chapter plays in USMCA. Well, I think we can't leave out uh, labor provisions as well. Look, th this, th this is some of the area or some of the times when I get frustrated when I know we have a consensus agreement. I know that there are more than enough Democrats and Republicans in the House to pass this bill. I know that there are enough senators, me included, to pass the, uh, the uh, USMCA. It, it, to be against the USMCA would be to suggest that we want to stay in place with, a, uh, with an agreement uh, that I think, I looked it up, I think who, there it is, was topping the charts uh, when, uh, when it was signed. And it's old. It worked at the time. It was difficult for North Carolina to actually uh, make the transition. Um, but in, in truth, some of that transition was hampered by the fact that some businesses had not invested in productivity. But now let's move forward. So why on earth would we stick with an outdated, uh, unbalanced uh, uh, agreement when we have something that Canada and Mexico, Mexico's already taken steps to change some of their laws to actually deal with the labor provisions of the agreement. It's just time to get it done so that we can then move on to other trade agreements. We should dust off the TPP. I don't think that we'll have a multilateral agreement there, but there are several bilateral agreements and maybe some regional subsets that we could get going. That's a strategically important matter, incidentally, for uh, our, our ongoing trade competition with China. And then we need to move to TTIP to get agreements with uh, with either separate, I don't know, Brexit, whatever Brexit's going to do, but with the UK and the European countries. We're going to be strategically better positioned uh, by having a whole host of trade agreements. And, and now time is, is uh, critically important. We passed Trade Promotion Authority. That actually gives the administration the opportunity to do accelerated uh, trade agreements. We've re-upped it, but now the clock is ticking. And quite honestly, I, I'm not making a 
political statement here, but trade promotion authority virtually never happens unless you have uh, Republican leadership in the House and Senate. And uh, we're not going to have that. So we've probably got a window of just a couple of years now to get some of these trade agreements beyond USMCA ratified and in place. And, and incidentally, labor likes his agreement. That's why I know that we have the Democrats and the Republicans to pass it. It's just a matter of getting it out to the floor and getting it to the president's desk. So we think trade is tremendously beneficial. Um, it, all industry sectors will benefit. Um, IP is interesting because it does cut across virtually every industry sector, increasingly in areas that people might not think traditionally are IP-intensive industries, things like agriculture even. Uh, so we're seeing a large number of folks increasingly focus on intellectual property. I just wanted to mention a couple of numbers really quickly. You know, according to our job study we did a couple of years ago, 1.8 million IP-related jobs here in North Carolina. That's a pretty significant number. Um, there's 11.3 billion in annual R&D, also pretty significant. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that when you talk about IP jobs, they tend to be good paying jobs, very well paying jobs, and they tend to be between 24, 30% higher than the national wage average. So you're talking about people who are making better livings as a result of these IP industries. So I think it's tremendously relevant to the Carolinas, but particularly North Carolina. You look at a city like Charlotte, it's got major sports leagues, great companies are headquartered here, uh, but you have things going on throughout the state that involve innovation. Um, are there any particular things in your last several years in the Senate that you've seen that you're particularly proud of in North Carolina that you'd like to perhaps uh, touch on in terms of some success stories you've seen? Well, I, I think if you, if you take a look at <clears throat> when, when I served in the, uh, the state legislature and we came in, in in the majority in 2011, the first thing I requested was a kind of a, a heat map of, uh, of industries with the goal of identifying what we consider to be the strategic sectors. Uh, agriculture and defense come up very high because of our military presence here and because it's a $90 billion industry. Uh, biotech came up just behind that. Um, if you take a look at some of our university collaborations, if you take a look at some of the biotech companies that are really across the state, uh, heavily concentrated, in the eastern part, uh, just look at the expansions. I can just run down the list of the thousands of jobs that have been created over the last eight or ten years uh, in the biotech space and agritech space. I call it all tech because you're right. If you, t you go to NC State, you take a look at a lot of the intellectual property they've created around agriculture. Uh, we have just e extraordinary potential as a state to really continue to be in the top quintile. Um, we already are. We have one of the highest, in the, in the Raleigh-Durham area, one of the highest concentration of PhDs in the country in Raleigh-Durham. That came as a result of investments they made in Research Triangle years ago when the naysayer said it's just a waste of time, it's government picking winners and losers. It was a good strategic vision that's paid off. Not all of them do, but that one did. Uh, and then here we've got uh, the financial services sector, uh, we've got engineering, uh, we've got energy. I mean, we have so much in the way of critical mass uh, in all parts of the state that uh, I think that we're poised as long as we get the regulatory piece right, as long as we get the intellectual property piece right, I see North Carolina remaining in the top quintile uh, for my lifetime. It's an exciting time for North Carolina. Um, I just want to circle back. You, you did mention China earlier, and I think it's important that folks realize you know, China has built its economy, you know, sometimes referred to as a counterfeit economy, because it's really built its economy on copying American innovation and stealing American creativity um, and invention. Uh, as a result of that, and we're not here to bash China, yeah, we are. But, <laughs> but we do want to remind folks of the fact that when we're dealing with a country that has a very different perspective, and it's a cultural perspective as well. Um, you know, they don't grow up, I, I think most of you know, and if you don't, I'll remind you, that IP rights were important enough to the founders of this country that they enshrined it in the Constitution. Um, it was actually something that spoke to the type of focus we have on property rights and individuals being rewarded for their invention and their hard work. And to have that sort of a focus and a heritage as a country 
it's really one of the reasons we've become the world leader, both you know, in terms of the global economy, but also invention, innovation, and creativity. China, on the other hand, is re they're responsible for somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 to 90 percent of the counterfeits that are currently available worldwide. Um, they come mostly out of Hong Kong, although this week I'm not sure what's coming out of Hong Kong, but there's an awful lot of things going on that I think Americans don't realize in terms of how some of these products are making their way to the American consumer and some of the risks you have, whether it's a you know, fake medicine made in unsafe, unsanitary conditions, a electronic component that could explode when you put it in your device, or a toy that may choke your child. There's any number of things or have lead paint, whatever it might be. So a number of concerns. Maybe just a few thoughts uh, before we move on to talking with the audience a bit about the role China's playing in terms of the overall global economy and, and our situation. I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. First off, I love competition. Uh, so China, in, in some respects, has been very helpful to us because they're, they, they motivate American ingenuity and American know-how. So I want competition. If we didn't have competition, uh, countries like China constantly threatening us, we'd probably get lazy and we wouldn't innovate at the pace that we do. Having said that, most of you in business here uh, suffer the same uh, tendency that I do, I think in terms of month in, quarter in, year end. China doesn't. They think in terms of 10-year, 100-year objectives. And this is where I, I have to... Um, I don't watch, with all due respect, any TV that may be here about. The only thing I watch is uh, Spectrum News, uh, <laughs> statewide, uh, Channel 3 from time to time, but mainly Bloomberg, constantly watching what's happening with global markets. And you, you're always thinking about the, the interday reports, you're thinking about the quarter end reports, the earnings reports, et cetera. China's not worried about their enterprises right now, whether or not they're making money. They're worried about whether or not their strategy to be the economic and military superpower by 2050 is on track. So we get frustrated with the president because we say, you've got to solve this trade deal. China says, all we've got to do is wait out President Trump. Um, we've got to recognize that the, the long-term economic consequences of expecting a, short, a, a quick fix could be devastating to business within the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, we're reaching a point where China's military capabilities, what they lack in quality, they exceed in quantity. They don't really care if an aircraft carrier uh, ends up getting hit in a place where we may have three walls or chambers to secure our troops. They, they just lose soldiers or sailors. So they don't spend the money that we do on survivability. They don't spend the money that we use on testing. 80% of our DOD budget is on human resources. It's almost the inverse in China. So if you, when you think about their counterfeiting, when you think about some of the air unfair trade advantages that they have with us, think about the threat to a potential war if we don't take them on at a point in time where we can reverse their course. Look, I want every child that's born in China to have the same kind of opportunities that kids have here in the United States once they prove that they can govern in a free and fair way. But we're dealing with a country that has, has basically taken, I, I, I'm co-chair of the Human Rights Commission, actually with Chris Coons, who I, uh, who's the ranking member on the, um, on the Judiciary Subcommittee. Uh, we just had a hearing about, about two months ago on a, an ethnic minority in China where a million people are in re-education camps because they don't think in the, religious, in, the, in the way that the Chinese government wants them to think. They're using, intellectual, they're, they're using artificial intelligence. How many of y'all have seen the Minority Report? There's a movie a while back where they would kind of predict you're going to commit a crime so they would arrest you ahead of time. They're using that kind of technology to find people that they think they should take out of society. This is the sort of mentality of a leadership who wants to be the global and economic superpower in potentially my lifetime. And so we, we've got to view the trade tensions through both of those lenses. I serve on Senate Armed Services. You've seen all the stuff that's publicly reported. Imagine if you've gone through 
literally weeks over the course of four and a half years of, of classified briefings on actual threats. So you all have to, have to recognize this is a point in time in history where we could get to a good, uh, reasonable trade agreement with China that over the next 10 or 15 years, whatever hits we may take right now, I think would more than make up. Now, what does that mean? It means that there could be some damage along the way. If this is a protracted war, then there is always uh, uh, a consequence. Some businesses, some sectors could suffer, and I'm painfully aware of that and trying to take care of those cases on a day-to-day -day basis. But if I take a look at the long-term payback of getting to a fair agreement with a president who's willing to take the heat right now and, and say things that no Democrat or Republican has said before since China's emerged since the 80s, uh, then it's something that we need to make sure that you're viewing this, not just from the lens of that month-end, quarter-end, year-end pressure that you all rightfully have, um, but look at it for the next generation. If we get this wrong, we could literally be talking about a generation away from having a very different uh, global geopolitical environment that the U.S. is operating in as a near-peer competitor to China and as the second or third most prosperous economy. That's not an environment any one of us want to make or have for our children and our children's children. You mentioned AI. Um, one of the things we're looking at is the incredibly rapid acceleration of technology and transformative uh, products. Things are literally going to change our lives in ways we can't even conceive, much like for those of us who are old enough to remember rotary phones, the cell phone has now become a computer in your hand. Um, the issues around intellectual property and something like AI are things that the committee will be looking at going forward. It's not, a, I mean, we could be here all day if we started opening up that can, but the truth of the matter is these are the kind of very, very complex issues the Senator is going to be grappling with and why his subcommittee is so critically important. Before we pivot to two final points uh, and get some audience questions, I just want to mention, you know, we didn't touch a lot on trademarks, but you know, we have NASCAR in the room, uh, you know, we have American Airlines and Charter, have some iconic brands here, um, and one of the great things about trademark protection is it helps consumers understand trusted brands. Uh, it's kind of been the poor stepchild in Washington of IP policy. And without getting too deep into that, I'd just like to thank the Senator for you know, addressing some of the issues related to brands. There are a lot of great brands in North Carolina, you know, VF Corporation, which has Timberland, and of course, North Face is some of its, you know, top brands. Um, these are things that consumers come to trust and rely on. So brand protection through trademarks, and for those of you who are not familiar, the four major forms of IP, of course, are patents, copyrights, trade secrets, and trademarks, and they all play a unique role in terms of helping to grow our economy and protect the consumer. Any thoughts on trademarks before we move on to the last no, I, I think the, the main, by the way, is there anybody from the Panthers organization here? I was wanting to get some coaching before my fantasy football draft tonight, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but um, I'm, uh, McCaffrey is a keeper. I'm bringing him back in the next year. But um, no, I, I think more than anything, our office engages uh, very actively. I think you'll find uh, Brad and Elliot and uh, my team members wanting to learn from you all. So if you have a particular interest in any one of the four lanes, then you should call my office, tell them you were here at the event and you want to just get feedback on what we've already put out or what the next steps are because it's, a, it's an iterative model. I've got really smart patents law people on my staff. They'd be happy to speak with any of you. It may be an area of jurisprudence that's problematic for you all that we may not have on our radar. We've looked at jurisprudence dating back to the days of the, the founding fathers, but we're always looking for ways to tailor it and do it right. So it's just an active engagement and I hired smart people to answer the technical questions. I think you know better than anyone that there's a real open door policy. So for those of you who are willing to take the center up on that invitation, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we have a great working relationship at the chamber with his office. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not thank the senator also for his hard work on making sure that the tax burden on the people in North Carolina has been reduced. Um, I don't know if you want to just touch briefly on that, but at the chamber, of course, we think that there's probably too many taxes and too many regulations burdening American industry and consumers. So thank you for that, Senator. And yeah, well, you know, the, 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 the problem with uh, the, the difference between the tax reform we did in North Carolina and the tax reform we did in, in D.C. has a lot to do with the way the two institutions work. We were able to 
over time gained pretty good consensus in the state for tax reform here, which was extraordinary in terms of the tax burden. I wish we could do the same thing at the uh, federal level between corporate and, and, and all other uh, taxes. Up in D.C., we had the limits of what's called reconciliation. It was a, it was a Democrats. It was, there was no agreement. It was, it was a, we called it a uh, shirts and skins game. It was all Republican votes that got it passed. I would have liked to have seen one that actually uh, focused, uh, that was a little bit broader based, but it's the votes that we had to unleash a lot of capital. We saw that. Now we're the, the GDP growth to this point is, uh, is at or well above in many quarters what we expected to pay for it. The personal income tax relief is something that is set to expire. I don't think that it will. The only reason they weren't made permanent is because of the way it scored. We couldn't, we couldn't make that permanent. We would have. Uh, but I do believe because it's, it's uh, on the individual that there will be political pressure not to raise taxes. The corporate taxes, we had to provide certainty. If we could only provide a five-year or six-year, seven-year window for certainty, that's not enough for businesses to move CapEx projects. It could be 10-year, 10, 15-year horizons. Uh, but we do need to go back to it. There's a lot of adjustments and tweaking that we could do like we did in North Carolina. And, uh, and we've seen the benefits in North Carolina. If you track how we performed when we were still not growing very well as a nation, we, we ended up moving from a fourth quartile performer to a top quartile performer in about two and a half years. And I think if you take a look at what we've done with the rainy day fund, a lot of other investments, uh, withstanding uh, hurricanes that we've, we've left the state in, in pretty, a pretty sound financial shape. You could always spend more money, you could always use more money, but I think we've got it on sound footing. We'd have to continue to do the same thing at the uh, federal level. My dream would be to get the people in the room, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, to make the next phase of tax reform fully bipartisan, boxing out either end of the spectrum, which tend to be the root of the problem in D.C.